we'll be looking at sort of uh, uh, what is going to be uh, fundamentally around mutability around uh, in-memory architecture uh, and how that contrasts with disk-oriented append-only systems. So with that, uh, Mike, let me uh, give you the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, so my name is Mike DiPrizio. I'm a senior architect at Akamai Technologies. I've been at Akamai 15 years now. Uh, I've had the pleasure of, of um, helping examine MemSQL's POC, and currently I manage the MemSQL platform that we brought in Akamai to install. Um, a little bit about Akamai. I'm not sure how many of you guys know what Akamai does or, or what we do, um, but most likely today, every one of you has actually used Akamai without knowing so. Um, Akamai serves somewhere between 15 to 30 percent of all web traffic. Um, we have over two trillion internet transactions a day. Um, you know, and then we have a corporate pitch here. The, the important thing to really take away from here, though, you know, if you've if you've used the web, if you've gone out and uh, downloaded music, if you've connect even particularly connected to your work remotely, um, you streamed any sort of video. Um, there's a good chance you've used Akamai before. Um, we, re we make the re internet fast, reliable, and secure, and we really focus on helping our customers get their consumers the best experience that they can out on the web. So today what I'm going to talk about is uh, an issue we had at Akamai, and really a, a use case of how we build today versus a, a new model that we're looking to implement and that we're looking to bring forth. So, the model, the way Akamai typically bills people, is similar to a, a telco. Um, you know, we, we gather up all the customer's usage. At the end of the month, we send them a bill. So we calculate your total bytes, you know, our total hits, or whatever MBPS, whatever metric the customer is getting billed on, send them a monthly bill. Um, the new model that we're looking to implement, uh, a product manager came to me and said, you know, Mike, we've got this new deal we're looking to do with our cloud partners. And the way we want to build with our cloud partners is, we don't want to build the cloud partners. We want to build the cloud partners' customers. Um, and I looked at them, I'm like, well, that's similar. We build resellers today. That's kind of a similar concept. Uh, how is this any different? He goes, well, what we actually need to do here is, is these guys really, not like resellers, they don't have hundreds and a thousand. They have hundreds of thousands of sub-customers. Um, we're talk talking about large cloud providers here. And also, we want to do this every day. We don't want to do this at the end of the month. Our cloud partners bill their customers on their own schedule. They can't, you can't just send them a bill at the end of the month and allow them to bill their customers. So we need to get them this data every single day. Um, and it needs to be accurate, because if we don't get them the data that they can bill their customers with, they're not going to bill their customers, which means we can't bill them for that same traffic. So a little bit about how we do things today. Um, Today we gather a log from our edge servers. We have over 190,000 servers in 1,400 locations in 110 different countries throughout the world. So we have a lot of data spread out in a very wide area. Multiple petabytes a day of traffic that we're going to take in and that we aggregate and reduce into a relevant billing data feed. So what is a relevant billing data feed? Uh, simple answer is basically a, a creation of a CSV type flat file, some sort of fixed format feed that we're going to bring into our internal systems to allow our internal systems to ingest the data and understand it. Um, typical data record today has three key fields. We have a piece of information about what, what the code the customer is, basically a customer code, um, piece of time depending on the time slice that we're looking to take this data across, um, as well as some sort of flag that tells us a little bit about this data, um, maybe the protocol that the customer is using, whether they're using SSL or not, um, maybe whether it's a response or request bytes or some sort of overhead. Um, and then we have metrics, bytes, hits, or whatever else, whatever widget we're looking to track that we're billing our customer for. Um, we take this fixed format file and we, we load it into our relational database management system. So what are the challenges? Um, the new model, the way we're looking to do things. So our current database system can't handle the expected throughput of this new model. Um, we expect this new model to generate far, far more data. And it's, it, it's interesting because it's one of those things where you have use of the factors. The other thing that the, the guy came up to me, the product manager came up and said, he said, you know, in addition to these sub-customers these days, we want to build 10 different geo-regions now too. So we have 
We actually have five key fields now. Now we have our customer, our time, our flags, and now we need our customer's customer, the sub-customer information, in this geography region. Um, and we're gonna expect that we're gonna get a large amount of this data. And the biggest challenge we have is it's tough to scale up database environments quickly. Um, today, if you have a database environment, you have a big database, it usually is what it is. Um, you know, it's good enough, you plan ahead, you buy something bigger than what you need, and you then next year you buy a new bigger database if you're gonna have a lot more data. That's not very conducive to scaling up quickly when our product managers wanna turn around products really quickly, um, wanna implement new models. If I go out and tell them, well, I gotta wait for the CapEx budget or um, somebody to go spend and buy a new large database system. So what did we do with MEM? Um, we brought them in for a POC. And we said, you know, how can you help us solve this problem? How do you guys do this? What exactly can your software do for us? Let, let's take a look at it, let's see what it can do. Um, so the application, our daily sub-customer billing. Um, our existing pipelines were, were maxing out at about 150, 300,000 upsearch a second, um, which just wasn't gonna keep up with what we projected on our new model. Um, and also, more importantly, it wasn't going to allow us to continue to scale. This is just one model. Um, this is one method of how we want to bill. The product managers are coming up with new models like this all the time. So this is one billing feed. We have 40 to 50 different feeds, depending on all of our different products, as to how we want to bill different customers. So it's every time one of these comes up, there's a big challenge with how do you solve it? Um, and how can we scale these things? And so really the results for their POC spoke for themselves. Um, we got two million upsearch a second on an on a Amazon Web Service um, cluster that they brought up, a relatively small cluster. Um, certainly met, up, met what our requirements were for the, what we were looking for. Um, and it was all running on commodity hardware, which is even better, because you can usually scale that up pretty quickly, um, especially in a distributed database case. Um, it, it unlocks revenue for us because if we don't, like I said earlier, if we don't get our customer the data immediately, um, they can't build their customer and therefore we can't build them. So it's really a lose-lose. No one's happy if the data doesn't make it through the pipeline and we don't bill them. In traditional sense, if I don't, you know, if I don't send my customer data at the end of the month and don't bill them, he's like, great, I got a cheaper bill. Um, but in this case, since he's charging his customer money and making money on all of it as well, it becomes a much bigger challenge. I have to get that data to him. Otherwise, I have to explain why not only am I costing my own company money, but I'm also now costing my partner money too. Um, and that, that doesn't work well for anyone. So what's next? Um, biggest challenge with the POC. I'm sure a few of you guys have done POCs with vendors. They usually work out great. And then you bring a system internal and you wonder, why isn't this working the way it used to work in the POC? The POC was awesome and I brought it internal and, and it's just horrible now. Um, because there's always additional requirements on a real world situation that we don't take account in the POC. And the POC, what MEM did for us, was they took files, they streamed them into the web service as fast as possible, um, and it worked great. And I said, well, you know, that's not a real life situation I can use for billing here. If I stream a file, and what happens if something fails? What if the file fails in the middle? What if you didn't pick up all the files? How do I know you loaded all the files? Um, you know, these are checks that you have to have in real world applications that you don't need in a POC. Um, so we made some tweaks to what we did in the POC in our internal system, in our development system. <coughs> and after making those changes, we were still able to insert two million upserts a second um, and actually make sure that we either fully loaded a file or rolled back the file if we didn't. Um, and we knew if a file failed, we could pick it up and re re retrieve it and restart the whole process, as opposed to just hoping that it got through. Um, I think it's important that also we really optimize these results with a very, very small cluster. So our development environment uses eight machines total to achieve these results of two million upsets a second. Um, actually, even far less machines than we used on the, our Amazon POC. <coughs> and we, st we actually started with five, and then we've upgraded, we, we pushed up to eight after that. And when we did, we actually saw that we had, you know, linearly scaling as well. And it's primarily because what we've made sure to do is, is our workload, as we load our workload and we've run the process and we've gone through everything, we've made sure that our bottleneck has been our CPU on our, our, our leaf node, the second tier of the, of the database. And that storage node that has all the data 
if you can keep scaling it out and that's where your CPU, that's where you're bound, you can actually get linear improvements by just doubling the size of the amount of leaf that you had. I'm sure there's some, some bottleneck that eventually hit a bottleneck elsewhere, but for now, we haven't, we haven't hit that yet. Um, so we've been, we've been extremely happy with them. 